The Green Rush, a podcast about the intersection of cannabis, the capital markets, and culture. On a weekly basis, hosts Ann Donahoe and Lewis Goldberg of KCSA Strategic Communications speak with the business leaders, financial experts, cultural icons, legislators, and generally interesting people moving the cannabis industry forward. In this special episode, Lewis and Ann are recording at the Cannabis World Congress and Business Expo and speaking with Erwin Simon, chairman of top Canadian licensed marijuana producer of Freya. An experienced entrepreneur best known for founding food giant Haines Celestial, Erwin talks with Ann and Lewis about his pivot to Afria and the particular challenges of operating in the legal cannabis industry. So don't sit back, lean forward. Now on to our interview with Lewis, Ann, and Erwin Simon. Hello, everybody. It's Lewis. I'm doing the intro today. Anne is off. And I think today's episode is a really cool one because it's relatively, I wouldn't call it unique, but it's a little different. Um, For the most part, we have focused on U.S.-based and focused cannabis companies. And while we've talked with Canadian companies like Canopy Growth and Valens Grow and others, today's on something kind of special. A few weeks ago, Ann and I were at the Cannabis World Congress and Business Expo in Los Angeles, and we had the opportunity to sit down and speak with Erwin Simon, the interim CEO and chairman of Afria. And yes, it's Afria, not Afria, um, which I learned at that time. Um, and if you're not familiar with Afria, it is a Canadian licensed producer or LP. It's listed on both the Toronto Stock Exchange and the New York Stock Exchange and has a market cap of around $3 billion, making it one of the largest cannabis companies in the world. It is also profitable, which makes it one of the truly unique cannabis companies in the world. Irwin is cool. He is a longtime successful entrepreneur, um, understands the concepts of alternative medicines. Um, He was a business executive who founded the Hain Celestial Group, which is a multi-billion dollar NASDAQ listed company. Um, And he's just a a really cool guy. Ann and I both walked away from this interview thinking, hmm, that's somebody I want to work with. And hopefully we will. But until that happens, we'll always have this podcast. So I hope you enjoy Ann and my chat with Erwin Simon from Afria. We are sitting with Erwin Simon from Afria, and if our listeners, I guarantee you our listeners know who Afria is, um, but uh, one of the biggest Canadian LPs, um, and to my knowledge, the only profitable Canadian You're the unicorn. LP. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so, Erwin, thank you for taking the time thank to sit down Thank you for inviting us. me, and my pleasure. And, and we are recording this on Friday, September 27th, which is just before Rosh Hashanah, so Lashana Tova. Thank you. Happy New Year to you, Lashana Tova. Um, take us back. How did you, a nice Jewish boy, get involved in the cannabis space? So, you know, let me take you back. Um, so I'm Canadian, grew up in Canada, lived there for a good part of my life, moved to New York 37 years ago, New York City. And, uh, who's got better bagels? (laughs) Montreal. Anyway, so I, um, Grew up in a little town called Glace Bay, Nova Scotia, um, and moved to New York to work for Hagen Dazs Ice Cream. And what happened was I ultimately um, got fired from my last job. So, A, being a Canadian, not having a green card or an L1 card, I was unemployable living in New York. And I love food. Most Jewish people do. <laughs> and I love Most food. Irish people do too. And with that, I said I was going to go out and start my own healthy food company. So in 1993, whatever money I had saved and whatever money, I went out and started a company. And at that time, it was called 21st Century Foods. What I built from there was the Haines Celestial Group, one of the largest natural organic food personal care companies in the world, with about $3.5 billion in sales mm-hmm. and about a $7.5 billion market cap at its peak. And today, Hain is still a vibrant company with products all over the world, one of the biggest suppliers to Whole Foods, Walmart, etc. I left there last December, um, 
after 25 years, I wanted to do something different. Um, I didn't smoke cannabis when I went to school. I was an athlete, and not that that had anything to do with it. But I always studied, and I felt I had a big part in playing in the way the world eats, introducing natural, organic, GMO-free, meat-free products, plant-based, non-dairy, one of the first with almond milk in regards to personal care products, no phthalates, no par parabens, etc. So been a big part of that movement. And I felt what an opportunity in the cannabis market to do the same and be able to build a global platform with cannabis that I was able to do with Haynes Celestro. So, you know, I started to think about that early on. I thought, again, that would be one of my next act after leaving Haynes. And in December, I got a call from a board member from Afria who was going through some issues and challenges. Um, I'm somebody who loves issues and challenges. And after 25 years being a public company chairman and CEO and being on multiple boards, I've seen it all, man. And I've seen everything out there. So they called me and asked me, told me they had a challenges with a report called a short report. They had other challenges in regards to a possible um, hostile takeover when I joined their board. And what year is this? This is December of 2018. Okay. Um, and I said, guys, I just kind of left that world. Um, and when I left Hain, I said, wow, no more earnings calls. I did 105 <laughs> earnings calls, okay? Oof. Oh, my God. And that raised billions of dollars. Life. It takes years <laughs> off me. You know, for a guy that's only 40 years old, I look, you know. <laughs> you look amazing. You know. Anyway, so, um, you know, I spent some time with the Afria board members. I spent some time studying Afria, and I said, this is interesting. So in December of 2018, the end of December, um, I became chairman of the board. And which, you know, I've been chairman of the board before, I've been the lead director, which, but I had to deal with, you know, a short report, I had to deal with a hostile takeover, I had to deal with certain you know, acquisitions being made against the two founders and the CEO. And I had to deal with a stock that was beaten up. I had to deal with a financial situation. Stock is still beaten up. The good news is misery lays company. The whole industry is beaten up. <laughs> yes. So that's part of it. So with that, we went through um, a mandate and did a review. Um, and, all you know, the CEO announced he was leaving and the two founders and before I knew it, on March 1st, I was the new interim CEO of the company. So that's how I got there. And Have we removed the interim title? You know what? Here's what I say about removing the interim title. You know, when I wake up every morning, and that's pretty early, whether I'm interim, whether I'm CEO or chief cook and bottle washer, whatever you are, I do the same type of job that I'm supposed to do. Um, I think, you know, as I look at where is... Um, you know, ultimately, as I look at succession planning, I look at the long term, but I am full in and plan to be full in for a little while yet. You guys are literally one of a, a handful of profitable cannabis companies. How did you do that? So, listen, the good news is when I got to a free, and I'm going to step back for a second, you know, what was in place was in a tremendous infrastructure of greenhouses of what they built and we spent a lot of money we have 2.5 million and I invite you sometime to come visit of greenhouses we will have the ability to grow 265,000 kilos of cannabis then we have 55,000 in Vancouver with Broken Coast which is a phenomenal brand and then we have licenses in Germany and South America etc so there was a lot of the pieces that were already there. And the next piece is, which I built around, is people. You know, Afria had some great people. It's just we were not pulled together. We were operating on different silos. And we were running all over the place. So, you know, I'm an operational, hands-on CEO. I get my hands dirty. You can see my fingernails are not groomed and cut and manicured. And with that, with a team, and bringing in some of my original team that I had with me at Hain, um, we rolled up our sleeves, and 
you know, we had put a plan in place. We're one of the first companies that have come out and given guidance for this year. We went out and did a convert and raised 350 million U.S. dollars. Um, we really strengthened the balance sheet. We got rid of our hostile takeover. Um, we, you know, uh, liquidated a Liberty investment we had, some other investments, and really focused on the balance sheet and really focused on growth. And today we're in a really, really good position. Um, you talked about um, your production capacity, which is probably well beyond what any what the, the country of Canada is going to be able to use. So, can, and you talked about some of the international markets. What international market are you most excited about? So, just let me come back. What you say today is beyond what any you know Canadian market could use. I think there's got to be some consolidation in, the, in Canada. Today, there is you know 200 LPs out there. There's a lot of grow. You know, if you come back and look, I think in Ontario alone, there is an opportunity for 3,000 stores, okay? And I think there's only 50, 80 open today, max. Everything was sold online. You know, if you come back and look at the market in Canada alone today, just in the, just in the illicit market, okay, I think the opportunity to take share away from the illicit market is tremendous. I think what edibles coming out, and vapes, there's a big opportunity. So from my standpoint, I think there's a billion dollars of sales opportunity within the Canadian market. And at a billion dollars? Uh, uh, an, an additional billion? Because the Canadian market is estimated at, at five billion. The Canadian about market five. is at about five billion. So if I can get a fifth of that, and I think there is, even, even take the vaping market, okay? There's a billion dollars today of vaping that's sold through the black market or the illicit market, and we get half of that. So I feel with the production capacity we have today and the opportunities, I think there's a big business and a billion dollars, we'll do quite well <laughs> with a free, okay? So let me come back next and let's look at our international markets. And I've traveled quite a bit, spent a lot of time internationally. You know, I just came back from Buenos Aires last week where from a medical standpoint and being GMP certified, Mm -hmm. And the opportunities that we have in shipping cannabis to all these different countries and being a GMP certified um, grower gives us tremendous opportunity to sell our products. Are you concerned, or, or concern isn't the right way of putting it, but Colombia is well positioned both regionally in Latin America and from a, a, a cost per gram perspective. Great question. Um, so how, are, how, is, how are you looking at Colombia and how are you looking at that as a either a production facility or jumping off point to Latin America or Europe, where does that fit? So with that, and I've spent time down in Colombia, so in my short period of time, I've traveled a lot. We're in the midst of investing 40 plus million dollars in building a greenhouse out in Colombia that will, and, and just gotta remember, there's 650 million people in South America. There's 32 million people in Canada, okay? So you go where the people are. So we will build out a facility in, Canada, in Colombia to service our South American market. And to, back to your point, you know, one of my biggest costs today is labor, where I'm paying $15, $18 an hour in the Canadian market, where in Colombia I'm paying $300 a month, you know, for the same labor. So my labor costs and my grow costs are much, much lower in the Colombia market. they say that the cost of growing in Colombia is literally one-tenth the yeah. cost of growing in Canada. Exactly. And that's why, as you come back today, and our investors are learning, as we look at what's the return on invested capital in building in Colombia and investing $40, 50000000 million in a greenhouse, the returns are tremendous there. So looking out five years from now, um, you've invested millions and millions of dollars in infrastructure in, in Canada to build out indoor grows and, and the supply chain, but the cost differential from a labor perspective and inputs perspective speak to growing elsewhere. Where is Af Afria moving or, or do you still believe that growing in Canada to serve the Canadian market makes sense? So listen, if I was starting today from scratch, they'd be a lot different than what I have, okay? So I've inherited, we've spent hundreds of million dollars of building out our Canadian operation. You know, everybody in the business has come back and said, we want to be the low cost producer. Well, yes, everybody wants to be low cost at everything they do, and that's just automatic. So what we have to do, the infrastructure's built, 
the greenhouses are built. As I said, I got 2.6 million square feet of greenhouses, okay? So I have to be a low cost producer. I have to have automation. I have to have innovation. And I have to have distribution. And I think the Canadian market is going to change tremendously of how products are sold instead of being sold through the liquor boards. I think it's going to be sold direct to retail stores. The other thing which I got to look at in the Canadian market is how do you become vertically integrated? You grow, we have our brands. Should we be in the retail business and owning retail stores? So I think you got to look at that market and see where the opportunities are. One of the biggest trends in the U.S. is the development of cannabis REITs that are doing sale leaseback. Is that something that you guys, is that something that's percolating up into Canada? Um, and, it, you know, for the U.S., it's been mostly sale leaseback on the, the retail facility, but they are starting to look at the grow or the processing. Is that a, a consideration that you guys are looking at? It's a possibility. It's way too early for us yet. I don't have our license yet in a free at Diamond, and I need to ensure I control my grow today. I control the, the quality, the strains, and whatever. Um, but... You know, in regards to our own distribution, our own supply chains and that is something that we are, you know, looking at of taking back in-house. And ultimately, if it made sense for us to, you know, today we have between our Broken Coast and our Freya One and our Freya Diamond, you know, we have a lot of money tied up in regards to greenhouses that doesn't make sense to turn it into a REIT. But right now, absolutely not. So the market in Canada is about to change pretty drastically in December. Um, October? December. Well, it's October. But that's the rules right. go into effect, and December and is when people are going to start to sell. See stuff on shelves. So yes. um, what do you guys have planned? So, you know, when you say the marketing is going to change, I think, you know, some of the stuff we battle in Canada today, and I understand and I've met with the government, you know, they want to keep recreational cannabis out of the hands, you know, of teenagers they 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 don't want it and make it look like this is a recreational you know yeah, they don't let you do anything well in terms that's of the big thing how do you market it <laughs> right. today and i think the whole thing with marketing is just not out there selling it's education okay yeah. and it takes a really really good public relations and uh, communications <laughs> team i i agree and i think the big thing today the education got to be done on a couple factors it got to be education how you take this out of the illicit market okay you know listen a lot of information coming out in regards to all this vaping and all these issues it's coming out of vaping that ultimately was purchased in the illicit market or oils that were purchased in the illicit market and combined with other vaping products so if you come back and think about the Canadian government I think they've been they were smart in one hand in approving recreational cannabis but if you come back and look at the size of, of, of cannabis sold in Canada today, only 25% of it is going through the legitimate market. The other 75% is still going through the illicit market. So there's got to be a way to educate and market to consumers that you know if you're buying a brand. And we have five brands today. So if you're buying a brand, you can trust that brand. What are your brands? List them out. Okay. Riff, Good Supply, Soleil. Broken Coast, and of course, Afria. So they are our brands today. And you know when you're buying one of those brands, you're buying a quality product. You're buying a product that's gone through quality assurance. You know a product that's gone through regulations before it's released, etc. You know you're buying strains, and how, st strains that you're getting and how it's processed, okay? You're not buying it in a plastic bag because some guy was or gal was growing it up the street. So I think what's important is this here, that the government allows us to market our brands, market and educates on safety, health, and what the products are. And not just, hey, here it is, it's okay to smoke, it's okay you know, to, to have you know, a pre-roll or something like that. What are the benefits from it? So I think that's, where the, that's what the Canadian government got to do, is let you market your brands, but also combine it with the whole educational part of it too, and allows you to take sales away from the illicit market because they make tax dollars on it, they create jobs, they do things for the economy and the local communities where there is greenhouses. So, and the, um, how will the new products 
um, you know, the edibles and other vape products nestle in under those five brands, or are you going to create separate brands, you know, no, given no, the new products available? Um, good question. So brands. a couple things. You know, I think the product the products will be sold under our current brands. And, you know, I always say this here. I want to free it to be the largest consumer packaged goods company you know, in the cannabis world. I'm a big believer, brand equity, brand equity, brand equity. I have twin boys, and when they're born, I want to call one brand and one equity, <laughs> but my wife wouldn't let me, okay? But that is what we have to do is build our brands across multiple products. The only thing I come back and I say is this here, I think, listen, vaping will be a big part, and, you know, it's got a little bit of a black eye right now of what's going on out there. Um, I think there's a big opportunity in edibles, and I think there's a big opportunity in drinks. The only problem is, it, how big will the drink market be if you're selling it through the liquor boards and not selling it through all the stores we today? Just, we just had Chuck Smith from Dixie Brands here, and Chuck is all in on drinks. And if you look at what Constellation's bet on Canopy and Canopy's bet on a acreages, they're all in on drinks. I'm dubious, you know, and, and some people are all in. What is your take on the drink category? I think I'm all in on drinks too, but I'm not all in unless you can expand the distribution and the sales, okay? There's two drinks out there. One's called Truly and one's called White Claw, which is a vodka drink that's mixed with club soda. You guys are both shaking your head because you know it. I'm or, a Bon and Vive fan. Okay. I'm actually okay. not a drinker. But okay, I've but, but if you come back, there's a billion dollars in sales today that millennials are drinking these drinks, okay? Right. But... You can go into Ralph's, you, you can go into, you know, Vaughn's, you can go into Whole Foods and buy those drinks today. You can go into Vaughn's, Ralph's, Trader Joe's and buy candy today. I think the whole thing is, is it going to be a big enough market if we're limited distribution and where we can sell them? And I think that's the big thing is how big it can be. We are, you know, we ask this question of every guest which is the, the, the... I thought I was special. Oh, uh, you are special. And by the way, I'm so digging your I love your the socks. avocado the socks. The avocado socks are awesome. Thank you. Um, but, you know... Three ninety nine at H&M, okay? <laughs> <laughs> are you a shareholder in H&M now as well? No, I'm not a shareholder in H&M, but I like their prices, Three ninety nine for socks. I believe, and we, we believe, that failure is the biggest teacher. Right? It, it defines us as humans because you can luck into success, but, but your success is usually predicated on all of the mistakes that you have made to get to that, to that point of success. And you know, for us, KCSA, my firm, has been around for 50 years, and it took us 45 years to become an overnight success. Right? A lot of mistakes, a lot of failure. What's the, 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 the defining failure of your career that has made you the success that you are today? Listen, I, I think success and failure are measured in many, many ways. And every day I wake up, I learn something new. And the only time I will stop learning something new when I can't move my elbows anymore and it's hitting a wooden box, okay? <laughs> but I, I think that's a big part of life is learning. And I have made multiple mistakes. You know, at Hain, I've done over 55 acquisitions. And some were great, some were good, and some had its challenges. So there was mistakes along the way. I made mistakes in not doing certain acquisitions where I looked at it in one way. Some of my biggest mistakes were people and hiring people. Some of my best decisions were hiring people. I made mistakes on new products that I thought would be home runs that were complete bombs, okay? You know, I, I've made mistakes in going into markets. and. I think the big thing is mistakes are part of lives. And I tell this to my kids all the time. You will make mistakes, but recognize when it is a mistake and what do you do about it. And that's the big thing is this here. We learn every day in, you know, from mistakes that we made. Mm -hmm. There's no one out there with a perfect record. If you are, you're not alive, okay? And you're not trying, right? And, I mean, and, and I'm a big risk, risk taker. I'm, I'm a believer is you take risks. Now, at certain times, what is the measurement of your risk? And if it is wrong, what's the destruction it can cause, okay? So I've had multiple bad decisions, multiple mistakes, but what I can tell you is this here, the biggest thing that I come back and I tell this to you know everybody, arrogance in business do not get along. And the thing is, is this here, when you're arrogant, too arrogant to say, 
I fucking made a mistake. It's okay. And that's okay. And I'm okay with people that work with me to come in and say, I fucking made a mistake, but here's what I'm doing about it. And that's the key is making that mistake and then saying, here's my plan to get myself out of it. Another question that we ask all of our guests, so sorry, uh, you are special. <laughs> but what are you, so, um, you know what, before I ask that, I'm going to ask the market's question. So, yeah. um, the market. <laughs> That's my question. About the markets what today? The fuck? You, you know, listen, language. I think here's the thing. Yeah. And, you know, it's really interesting because, you know, being a public company CEO for 25 years and quite in tune with the market and, you know, been interviewed numerous times on multiple CNBC shows, et cetera, and look at the market every single day. Um, even when I'm in synagogue, I do sneak my, you know. Do you, how often do you actually check the stock price? I don't check the stock price. I have, and if you look at my phone, I have a lot of stocks. I check just what's going on in the market because it kind of reflects back on the world and certain things. You know, I check half a dozen times a day at least what's going on in the marketplace. Listen, I think if you come back today and you look at, um, you know, what's gone on with Uber, what's gone on with Lyft, even what's gone on with Peloton, you know, what's happening out there. Listen, I tell my brokers, I don't trade stocks, but I tell those that manage my money, I don't want to own things that don't make money. And if there's no growth and it doesn't make money, and when you lose $200 million a year or you lose a billion dollars or like we work that loses 1.9, how do you ever get the profitability to stay in business? And I call that hocus pocus, but, okay? But respectfully, Amazon lost money until it made money and then it makes more money than any company has ever made. Yeah, but Amazon did not make money, but it had unbelievable cash flow, okay? And I'm a big guy on cash. I tell this to everybody. When you go to an ATM machine, you don't get adjusted EBITDA, you don't get EBITDA, it's either cash or no cash. When you're at a when you're at a cash, you're at a business. So Amazon had a model that just drove a lot of cash, okay? And I think at that time it was in a different era. But today, I think what's important is this here, as investors come back, they want to own companies that are doing three things growing organically they are profitable or they're cash flow positive or they're paying dividends, okay? And, you know, the cannabis world has gone through, all these companies went public at just crazy, crazy valuations. We're one of the only companies that, you know, ultimately uh, were profitable. The other problem is we had our own, we had scandals throughout the cannabis market, which does not help. And then- And continue to. And you continue to. And then you come back and you got valuations that are out there that the founders and that expect these valuations to come back to numbers, okay? And that's not going to happen. So, you know, either a lot of these LPs are going to go away or there's going to be consolidation so out there. How much impact do you think the Can Trust fiasco has had across the entire Canadian LP market? Because it's not fair to tar you with that, with that you know, scandal but everybody has gotten slapped with it. So I come back and I say this here. The industry was moving so fast that I think Health Canada wasn't prepared in issuing license and, and, and that in regards to what had to happen there and how it was oversight of, you know, all these LPs, okay? So that's number one. Number two, investors come back and sort of say, wait now, this is the wild, wild west. I don't want to own these stocks until there's better regulation, better understanding. What's the governance behind those in regards to, you know, from a market right. standpoint? What are the boards looking like? The other thing is this here. A lot of these big institutions, they're not allowed to own cannabis stocks because their investors forbid against them. So I think that's some of the negative. And I think ultimately... As the industry gets smaller, which it's got to do, some of these LPs go away or some of them merge. If you come back and look at this here, look what's happened with Canopy was one of the biggest. You know, Aurora recently came out and gave guidance and missed numbers. You know, Tilray, if you come back and look at Tilray, the majority is still owned by, you know, it's private equity. 
Afria had its own issues too, and we, we did that and can trust. So if you come back and look at the good guys, we all had some warts and, you know, blemishes against us, and we have to overcome that. And the big thing you, you say before, we have to accept that, okay? We can't just, you know, what happens is this time, people just say it's the market. It's not the market, it's the companies that got to accept that and got to deal with it, and how do we move forward? Uh, you guys are traded on the uh, TSX and the uh, NYSE. And, uh, the NYSE. New York Stock Exchange. Yeah, NYSE. Um, are you seeing, a, and you mentioned, you know, off mic, um, you know, obviously a lot of retail investors are in this space. Um, are you seeing that start to move a little bit to a more sophisticated um, investor base? Or are you still, you know, dealing with a lot of investor calls who are like, I've, you know, the, the grandmother like, that grandmother was like ten shares yeah, and, sees and a right. at ten cents. You know, if somehow people get a hold of my cell phone and I get texts all the time, and unfortunately, as I said before, this industry used to be about if there's not a press release out by nine thirty, then start a rumor, okay? And it was run by rumors, and it was run by press releases, and everybody wanted to get press releases out. Um, again, and I, because of my relationships and years being a public company. You know, I've gone out there to see institutions and that. They're not yet jumping into this industry in the big way because not the profitability there yet, not the conviction that there's good governance in place yet, not the conviction that the a real CEO is in place yet. And, and last but not least, they want to see companies that are going to start making money. All right, you've been really generous with your time. Uh, we have one last question. I never met a Mike I didn't like, so don't. You well, know. you're doing great. I mean, this is, and by the way, this is a lot of fun, and you really Thank are you. really engaging. And and you know, we the, the vast majority of this industry has been built, especially in the U.S., but even in Canada, by financial operators, not by business operators. And and you, as somebody who is a true business operator, it's different. Right? You look at the way that the MSOs in the U.S. have been put together. They have been stitched together. Right, You've got guys from Wall Street, private equity guys, hedge fund guys who gone out and bought as many licenses as they could. And then they said, oh, we're going to figure out how to, to actually grow and, and sell. You, on the other hand, are not a cannabis guy and you're not a financial guy. You are somebody who built a, a multi-billion dollar company, which is different in Afria. So you wake up tomorrow morning and you open up the New York Times or you open up the Wall Street Journal or the, the Globe and Mail. What is the headline that the mainstream media is missing about cannabis that they should be reporting on? What's that one story that you're like, fuck, they missed it again, they missed it again. What is it they should be writing? So here, here's what I come back and say is this here. And that's a great question. Because if you look today... In the consumer packaged good world, in the food industry that I come out of, there's no growth. If you come back and look at the retail industry, there's no growth today, okay? If you come back and look at a lot of these startups, there's growth, but they're not making money, okay? So if you come back and look today, what's going on with the whole opioid crisis and stuff like that? I think what comes back and sort of say, how do you get growth back in the food industry with CBD within food, okay? How do you get growth? The soda industry is declining 7% a year. How are you going to get growth back in the oh, beverage right. business? Good, right? right. Too, many, too many obese kids drinking right. too much Coke. Sugar. How do you get growth back in there? It's with CBD and drinks together. In regards to supplements, there's so many vitamin C's, D's out there. What is the right, you know, cannabis story? So I think is this here. How do we market it? And it goes back to the right PR firm. It goes back to the right getting the messaging out there, the benefits behind the products, and that there's real growth. There's 150 billion, and that's bees, okay, not million, industry out there, global. As I said to you before, I just came back from Argentina, Buenos Aires, and I was with one of the top hospitals there, and we're part uh, of this study where in regards to epilepsy within kids and kids that were having 300 seizures a day and using CBD has reduced that to a third. We're working with a patient today, a little girl out of the UK, where we've been providing the CBD and that for her. 
and she was getting close to uh, 35, 40 seizures a day. She's not getting any anymore because of that. You know, I, I recently had an elderly person call me and say that had Parkinson's, couldn't sleep, anxiety, and pain. And her life has changed today because of CBD and what she's able to do and from a vaping standpoint. So I think the messaging out there, the validity out there, listen, it was just great to see the Bank Act just get approved going through Congress. Now it got to go through Senate and Trump's got to sign it in. You know, if I did it. still there. What part? If yes. he, it'll be still there. But, you know, it, that's the whole thing today is how we legalize and legitimize this industry. And that's got to be the biggest headlines. There's a retail. There's a consumer products. There's a drug part of it. There's a beverage part of it. And then there's a, listen, we'll do a billion dollars. We cannot put money in a U.S. bank today because still not legal. You can and, trade on the exchange. but You, you can trade on the exchange, but I can't put money in Bank of America, Wells Fargo, or J.P. Morgan today. So that's a lot of those things that got to happen out there and a lot more education. And let me tell you something, it's going to happen because this is a millennial product and millennials today are the biggest part of our population. Erwin, thank you so much for thank being you. so generous with your time. Thank you very much for having me. A special thanks to Erwin Simon chairman and interim CEO of Afria. Um, as always, if you want to chat with Ann and I, you can find us on Twitter with the handle at the underscore Green Rush or on Instagram at the Green Rush underscore podcast. As always, you can drop us an email to greenrush at KCSA. And we are always looking for feedback. We're looking for guest ideas, questions, uh, other bad dad jokes. Um, and anybody who sends me a bad dad joke, I will send them a couple of Green Rush stickers. Please take a moment to rate and review us on um, the Apple Podcast app, on Google Play, on Stitcher, or wherever you are listening to this. And I also want to extend a special thank you to everybody who has taken the time, one, to listen all the way through this episode, but to listen to us at all. Time is the truly only finite resource we have in our lives. And for every moment that you are giving to us to listen to this podcast, you are choosing to take it away from somewhere else. So thank you. I truly and deeply appreciate it. Um, and with that, that's one motherfucking take, Shay. One take. <laughs>